days here at the Writer's House. Normally, we would, in a, in a non-pandemic year, is this still a pandemic year? I guess it is. We would normally have served lunch, and you'd be sitting with lunch on your laps, but that would make optional masking impossible because you have to eat. So this is not an airplane. Um, what that means is that at the end of our conversation, which is going to be, uh, hi, come on in, which is going to be an informal Q&A, you know, um, I've just read Wendy's book very carefully with great um, gratification and enlightenment, which I'll tell, more, tell you more about in a second. And I'm very, very excited that Wendy is here. And but so I'm going to kind of ask some questions that will that will prompt Wendy to tell us about the book. But then there'll be a point where I will turn to you for your questions, and you don't have the advantage of having read the book because it's not out yet. We'll tell you about that in a second. Um, and then at the end, still informally, we will break and we will go into the other room, to the dining room, and there'll be box lunches there for you. And though <coughs> ma masks are optional, hi, masks are optional here in group settings at the, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. If you feel like you want to take the box lunch Elsewhere, it's warming up, and we have a tent outside. So, if you want to go outside, you can. If you want to hang around with Wendy and me, you can do that. So, thank you. First thing we need to do is put our hands together to welcome Wendy back to the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> the book that Wendy has written, I'll tell you the title, you tell us the subtitle because I can't remember the subtitle. There um, is no subtitle. Oh, good. Prosecuting <laughs> Poverty criminalizing care and actually that's a title that tells you a lot about the book as you'll see in a second um, Wendy uh, you know exactly what Wendy has been doing because we've sent you so many email invitations that the <laughs> bio is there I'll just say almost a personal note that the emer in a catch-up conversation a year ago um, it became clear that you were working on this book, that it was well in process at that point, and I thought, you know what, the Kelly Writers House is about books, and it's not just about segregating disciplines, you know, only poetry here and only legal stuff over in the law school. So we are excited to be essentially helping to launch a book that is being published when? Allegedly August 21st. 2022 by Cambridge University Press this, and it's available this for pre-order. Oh good. <laughs> this wee little nothing press, Cambridge University Press. <laughs> and Wendy has achieved something that no other Cambridge author that I know of has achieved, which is to get Cambridge not to charge $90 for a paperback. In fact, it's going to be in the 30s, which is an uh, I think total, 35.99 which is, is a total doing. accomplishment. So I hope that one of the results of this conversation will be that you will pre-order it and that you will read it. It is, I may say, in anticipation of my first question, Wendy, it is a profoundly dark and depressing book at certain moments <laughs> that legislatures, state legislatures, supported somewhat by courts and accidentally supported by researchers, although they seem to have corrected their mistakes or tried to correct their mistakes, could do something so obviously heinous and stupid, then it, need, it was so heinous and stupid that you just sort of say, whew, you know, like at least that piece of legislation became defunct after a while. But the ideas that made that piece of legislation happen not only continue to happen in many states, but have a long history and tradition, is tradition the right word, that Wendy, for the first time, I think, studies. So in the middle chapters of this book, we go back in time and we realize that the moral panic on the right leaked over to the center and got everybody involved in worrying about so-called crack babies and using the criminal system to criminalize what mothers have gone through, mostly trauma and poverty. That's the book. So I wanted to ask you to give us a little of the background to yeah. start of the moral panic around the oxytot and the, and the crack baby so-called. It is a sad story. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I said this book is bleak and dark. Did I say bleak? 
But as you'll see at the end of our conversation, it is incredibly hopeful and positive about things we need to be doing. And people, and particularly in law schools, who are going to become lawyers, need to do in order to make sure this kind of crap doesn't happen again. <laughs> So, um, thank you. Wendy, Let me just thank you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. I told Al that, like, you know, he wouldn't give me the questions in advance, and I felt like I was like coming to class without doing my homework. So I'm gonna do my best. Um, Al and I go way, way back, um, and it's a thrill to be back on the Penn campus where I haven't been for decades. Um, so. I think the origins of this story, so just to give you a flavor, in 2013, the Tennessee legislature passed a, a statute criminalizing a particular form of conduct, the um, transmission in utero of opiates to a fetus. It was an A misdemeanor for the law students in the room, um, which meant you could be punished up to 11 months and 29 days in jail. Um, and we, we'll talk more about that. But there are several historical roots to this idea. One is the sort of horrific story of the crack baby. Um, in the 1980s, a doctor named Dr. Ira Chasnoff did a little bit of research, published actually a fairly, at least in that moment, moderately framed study around potential effects. And interestingly enough, if you read the actual study, it says we're seeing these things, but we're not sure and more research has to be done. Then, quite unfortunately, not only the media um, sort of turned this into the story of the crack baby. Um, Chasnoff himself really got swept up in all that, started to say things that were quite inappropriate and overblown given his data around the health effects of crack cocaine. You saw in Time Magazine in 90. 89, I can't remember what year, um, right, right, crack kids on the cover of Time magazine. You see this whole story and in what, you know, and then over the years, a uh, fantastic, actually in Philly, a doctor named Dr. Hallam Hurt did a 25 year longitudinal study of infants, comparing infants who were exposed to crack cocaine in utero to in, uh, infants of similar race and socioeconomics, studied for them for 25 years, and found that um, those groups of kids were actually quite similar and that poverty and trauma were the source of the issues you, you were seeing, right? So it's, I mean, what she would say is it's not, right, it's not crack, it's poverty, right? It's racism. So, so then we lay a groundwork Right, so then we're gonna criminalize them and there's a big long story about the criminalization of moms who are arrested. Um, and we see that sort of in the first big wave is in the 80s and 90s. And then as the cocaine, right, as cocaine is, and crack cocaine fades, you see other drugs, opiates. And then you have the same story and we get the label oxytots. What's interesting, and there are lots of interesting things about that, but, but we see the same mechanisms being turned both consistently against poor women of color, but also then against poor white women during the, um, during the opiate epidemic. So we can talk more about this sort of complicated race story, but you see that. But then there's a lots of other sort of deeper trends around the meshing of social support and healthcare with criminal systems, with child welfare systems. and. Essentially, what happens, and Karen Tani's here, so I'm going to be careful about my historical statements. Um, but, uh, but, um, but you see in certain aspects of the social welfare state that aspect of the social welfare state targeted at folks in poverty a meshing of those systems, right? So policing inside those systems, and it plays out. So even though the fetal assault is law is this bizarre phenomenon, at not sadly not as bizarre as we would hope, but still quite the Tennessee story, it's enmeshed in that history of, of the merging of, of punishment and support. And you describe, I think, really lucidly, a merging, unfortunately, of two concepts. One is criminality, right. and the other is care for people who are suffering from trauma, poverty, racism, and drug addiction, yeah. drug addiction gets seized as a way of avoiding all of those more structural problems. Yeah. 
So that's, that's where we get the title, Prosecuting Poverty. So this idea of jail care <laughs> or the criminal system as a locus of care, yeah. I would love for you to explain that for people. Sure. So Bizarre, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, it is, it is wackadoodle, as we would say, right? Like, you know, if you think just conceptually, like one system is supposed to help and support people, right? Social welfare, health care, right? That's, that's, if you read the statutory purpose of those programs, that's what that's supposed to do. Right, criminal systems and child welfare systems are for something else, right? Child well, like one can debate about the child welfare system, but they're certainly, right, different from what should be social support. And criminal systems are for criminalizing conduct, right? We don't like people to murder other people; we criminalize that conduct. But and we will sometimes take their baby away from them if they're a murderer. Yes, but that you yes, show we will. that we will do that. <laughs> But that, you show, gets extended right. all the way to you did drugs while you were pregnant. Or you were prescribed drugs during pregnancy, but we're still going to open a child welfare case against you. But what's happened, right, so one of the things I talk a lot about in the book is the ways in which as the social welfare system for folks in poverty depletes over time, what you have is increasing location of care systems inside of punishment systems, right? So I interview a ton of people in the book who who just, you know, and I interview mostly professionals um, over the course of the research. So defense attorneys and prosecutors and drug court folks and social workers and mm. program providers. And over and over I, got, I ask them, is it easier to get treatment and support inside or outside of these systems? And like with, without hesitation, without a beat, right? They say, oh yeah, you know, that's, you have to get arrested to get care, right? And I had um, one of my favorite moments in the book is a doctor named Dr. Stephen Lloyd, who's, mm. who's a um, very prominent addiction specialist in Tennessee and nationally. Um, and he said, knowing everything I know, if I knew a person in Greene County, I think he said, in Tennessee who needed treatment, I'd tell them to go shoplift. Because that would get them to drug court, and there you right, and that would get them to. So favorite. this, Wendy, you yeah. show creates a vicious cycle. If that's the case, right. neutrally speaking, objectively speaking, get better care inside in jail, then you get the state legislature uh, stipulating. You get care inside. I you don't get know if care. It's right. Stipula <laughs> stipulating what that expert yeah. said. Then you get state legislators right. who feed themselves each other the bullshit right. that if this is the best way to get care we need to criminalize right. it so, so that, let's create a crime so women, to create care we feel we need to put them in jail because that's the best place to get care what's wrong with that picture many 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 things <laughs> um, right so i mean that is this reality and it's a devastating reality on the ground right um there's a woman who testifies at the hearings, and there are lots and lots of legislative hearings for various procedural reasons, but this this was a hearing that was took place after the law had been in effect in a while. Um, and she is sort of trotted out by the folks in favor of extending the law to say, to testify in favor of it, right? She was prosecuted. She received um, treatment from the Shelby County Drug Court. And the legislature, and I remember reading this over and over and listening to the testimony, and he said, um, what would your life be without this statute? Meaning the crime, right? The criminalizing of this conduct. And she says, I'm very grateful for the program, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It's not a program. It's a crime, right? <laughs> right. But it is a program. Mm -hmm. And from her perspective, she's located in a structure where she couldn't get help before this moment. So I understand her gratitude for this program. My problem with this is why the heck isn't there a program for her where she could get the help she obviously needed and wanted, right? So that's a reality on the ground that is creating this absurd and horrific situation. And, you know, I corrected you a little bit about the care, right? One of the things I talk about in great detail in the book is the ways in which location of care proximate to or inside punishment systems degrades that care, right? That it influences 
how people think about treatment decisions. So like an obvious example is like women didn't want to get prenatal care because you know what? They were going to be prosecuted. They're not stupid, right? So they're going to try to, and there's other research that shows this, right, to evade um, detection, right? Last thing you want people in a medical setting to do is withhold information to evade detection and to be worrying. But they were right to worry. So sorry. Go on and on. <laughs> no, no, it's it's just an amazing it's an amazing story, and it's gratifying as a general. What am I, an educated non-specialist? You know, to read a book that is, it's a law, it's a it's a law professor writing, but it's a book about a story that is so fundamental, and the you you ta you taught me so much about the issues of reproductive justice that I just didn't understand. So. Yeah. It's ex it's exciting that you know you put all this together. I'm sure it was. Enter Dorothy Roberts in 1991. Yeah. Harvard Law Review. The articles punishing drug addicts who have who have babies, women of color, equality, and the right of privacy. So now we specifically get to the issue of race, mm -hmm. and Dorothy says um, refers to the devaluation of black women as mothers. Mm -hmm. That was an important article for you. Yes. As is Dorothy Roberts' work. Yes, it is a, she is an important human in this conversation, and she started it long before the rest of us. So we, I stand on many, many people's shoulders in this. Um, yes, so the race story of this, this book is a complicated one. Um, so just to get you, give you a little bit of a sense, about 120 women were prosecuted. If you know anything about Tennessee geography, which you don't have to, right? Um, the, the eastern part of the state is in rural white Appalachia, right? There are cities, but it's, this is Appalachian poverty, center of the, right, the epicenter of the opiate epidemic in Appalachia. So m m most of the prosecutions take place in Appalachia, with the exception of one woman, um, all of them are white in Appalachia, white and poor. Um, there are 25 prosecutions that take place in Memphis. Uh, Memphis is a majority black city, um, and that is a more mixed race population. So it's a very complicated race story, and I think the thing I came to understand, so there's these images, and you know, at the time, they're still around, but you see these images of these little white babies, right, with, with um, sort of medical technology, right, like on the little ankle thing and a wire, and it's like all, right, and it says your baby's life shouldn't begin on drugs. And it's very explicitly a white baby, and we're talking about white mothers. And, right, so the category of white, right, if the category of black motherhood stereotypically and structured into their systems is a category of non-motherhood, right? Like a not, right, like a black woman in this trope, the mother, the crack baby mother, or right, black womanhood more generally, the category of sort of pure motherhood or ideal motherhood, black women are excluded from that category pretty categorically. But not white women, right? White women are the category of sort of good motherhood. So when over and over in the hearings, there's all this talk about the court system transforming these bad mothers, right? Read bad white mothers into good mothers, read white mothers, right? So, so the race politic of the Appalachian prosecutions are really interesting. And a guy named Matt Ray wrote a book called Not Quite White. Right, and this this conception that in order to maintain white supremacy, you have to exclude certain white bodies from that ideal. Um, but then, it, then you have you also have a super interesting racial dynamic, um, east to west, because Memphis is urban in a way that no other, none of these other spaces. This that was the place where there actually was a drug court, um, so women got more access to treatment actually in Memphis because of the resources of that city, but treatment at an enormous cost, right? Which is what we see in problem-solving courts is certain people get into those problem-solving courts, they're given an access to treatment, but boy, if you fail, down comes the hammer in a way that is very different from what would have happened had they not agreed to, to, to enter those, those drug courts, which I talk about too. So let's turn to the problem solving course. You take them to task. I um, do. <laughs> this is, if you're in law school, maybe this is just a totally familiar history. The problem no. solving court movement, which is allegedly or putatively a progressive movement, mm -hmm. becomes a villain in your book. Yes. Can you tell us why? 
because I think we should provide care outside of court. Right? That would make sense. So why is this such a <laughs> why is why was this a progressive idea? Well, it's progressive in the sort of constraint, like progressive constrained by stigmatizing ideology, right? So the problem solving court has its first big iteration um, in actually sort of in the 30s in America, right? But it's always about reforming bodies, right? Even as it is about, right, help. Um, its recent iteration starts with in the 80s in Miami. And now we have what over two, three thousand problem solving courts of every, every, you know, any problem, right? And there are vivitrol courts, my favorite, um, right, where we have a court just for the purpose of giving a particular drug. There are child welfare courts, there's safe baby courts, there's right, veterans courts, right? And it's this conception. And, you know, again, like, at, I, I am not interested in in blaming any particular individual. We're talking about situated individuals, right? Who, so from the perspective of courts, right, we've destroyed the safety net to the extent that we ever had one. You have this, you know, we like move everyone out of mental health hospitals, right? Like it's bad, right? None of these things are good. So you have judges reacting in the 80s and 90s saying, these people are here. We don't want them to go back to prison, right. so let's provide services in courts. My issue is never with any, well, mostly, never with any one person's decision, right. but it's a bad social, right? Like from a matter of social policy, it's bad. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of critique and all the evaluative literature doesn't ask the hard questions, doesn't ask, you know, what led to these circumstances, doesn't ask if it could be better if we didn't, doesn't really ask if treatment is even more effective in these courts. And, you know, you, it's, it's lovely. Like, you see these drug court graduations and everybody cries and it's all, right? And for that situated individual, you know, the other part of me is a defense attorney in juvenile court. I me use all these mechanisms in my work, right? I don't, right, it is, it is, it is a little bit better then maybe it would be sometimes, although even that knows not so much, but it's not the world we should have, which is why I take it to task. It, the, if I, I have two more questions and I wanna open this to, to the floor for questions. And there are also people watching on YouTube. Zach, are you watching the chat? Would you encourage people watching by YouTube to post comments or questions? Um, and greetings to you. I'm sorry we don't have lunch for you wherever you are. But, um, <laughs> This is, I just want to add a like editorial insertion from across another discipline. Yeah. This is why I like to read books not by scholar theorists who don't go before such a court, and why I do like to read books written by people who are only practitioners who are only going before courts. But the idea that you this is your your thing, you are a scholar law law school professor and practitioner clinician. Yes. And this is the book written by that person. And I think that really makes a difference in the re in relation to a critique of the problem solving court system. Yeah. I'm going to read you a sentence that you wrote in this book <laughs> on this and ask you just to say more about it. So yeah, it, yeah, yeah. it sort of says what you just said. Okay, go. Instead of focusing so this is Wendy on her high horse, you know, saying what she thinks. Instead of focusing efforts on shrinking the feeder systems that led to the criminalization of wide swaths of poor communities and growing social support, footnote, the problem-solving court movement took the fact of prosecution and criminalization as a given. Yeah. So they're just like, it's not even a Band-Aid. No. No, I mean, it's, right, if you start logically there, we should prosecute, we should, right, prosecute people for all kinds of things. You bring them in front of the court, and then the court is faced with what to do, right? Um, my favorite story, so, so, I mean, that is, right, if you're not going to ask whether this is the place or whether we should be using the mechanisms of the, of the criminal system or the child welfare system to solve these problems, and then you start, right, if you don't question that, then... You know, everything I describe in the book makes a lot of sense. So, but just to sort of pull out a fact from the hearings, right, this logic gets really skewed, right? So there's this amazing moment in the testimony where, I mean, if you talk to drug court judges, you know, and I know them, some of them are my friends, right? But um, they think they are just 
doing wonderful stuff. And some of them are for some people. But um, there's a moment when a representative talking during the hearing says, referring to the statute, he says, this, meaning the, the statute making a crime, would be great for our drug court. Mm. Right? <laughs> you know, and I wanted to like reach through meaning, the screen. Meaning it meaning, would give them more business. Meaning it would give them, because you know what? Defense attorneys don't want people to go to drug courts because you know what? It's too risky. Right? Yes. It's too risky for your client because they bring the hammer by design. right? And I have a judge I quote where he says, I make you plead, I give you a harsher sentence yes. at the beginning of drug court, and then about 50% of the people make it through, whether they their lives are better at the end, I don't know, but they do make it through the program. But the ones who fail at about 50% get the hammer. right? So as a defense attorney, I've once in my life agreed to go get someone to drug court, and that's another story. But um, but they don't get business, because you know what? Nobody wants th- to subject their clients to this, so they can't fill their seats. So let's create a crime You talk to about a seat. structural flaw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's a forest and trees problem. It's yeah. an analytical problem, which yeah. is... So my last question for now, and then I really want to hear your questions. We have a portable mic so that you can be heard you know, in the recording. Um, you talk about, you've, you, you introduce this a couple of times and then you come back to it at the end and I'm gonna, at the end I'm gonna ask you to read the final paragraphs about the importance of intersectional, intersectionality theory mm-hmm. in dealing with this forest and trees problem. I'm gonna read you another quote because I think it's really powerful in elucidating what you're saying here and I'd love your comment. Okay. Reproductive justice is steeped in intersectionality theory and demands three interlocked human rights. The right not to have children using safe birth control, abortion, and abstinence. The right to have children under the conditions we choose. And the right to parent the children we have in safe and healthy environments. And that last one probably includes not being separated from your child by the criminal system. Yes, that's what we need, right? I mean, and I'm just going to add because I have it here too, right? It also places the obligation on the government and society to ensure that the conditions are suitable for implementing these decisions, right? So, and that, I mean, I think, you know, that that the government has a moral, and I would say, right, and in inter- international human rights norms, a legal obligation to provide the conditions of the su- of support. I don't think it's useful to gloss over the enormous trauma and deprivation that constitutes right how we deal with poverty in this nation. I don't think we should be naive or understate what is lacking. But you know, women and their families need support. Right, and I think what's interesting about reproductive justice. So, reproductive justice is, is a is a sort of theory and praxis created by Black women in response to the failures of the women's movement, the white women's movement, to conceptualize reproductive rights beyond abortion. Frankly, um, right. So the the ability to create families, right, to have what you need to be safe, to be fed, right, to have enough cash, right, to be able to make choices freely for how you want to support your families and the structures to do that. And that's, you know, when you take, talk about forest and trees, right, Um, it was interesting writing the last section of the book, which is the, what the heck do we do, right? (laughs) Because, right, that's what we have to do. And I spend many, many pages talking about things we can do short of that, but that's what we have to do. So what you've taught us here is that because trauma, poverty, and substance abuse are inextricably inextricably linked, (laughs) we what the mistake we make is to go to the third abuse and making it a crime and saying and checking that box and leaving the treatment of trauma and poverty which are about care that the government can make a right yeah make it supported and funded um we just leave those aside and what dorothy roberts shows is that we just seized on the substance abuse thing and that alleviates us of the responsibility to deal with traumatic circumstances 
of mother and child right. and poverty, which are, as the research shows, every bit as responsible for what happens to the child as NAS. Right. Well, significantly more. Right. And significantly right. It's not, more. It, right. And like, w- w- you know, the ultimately with the crack cocaine, they're very small effects that you can trace to the exposure but itself. But poverty and trauma is but huge. But poverty and trauma is huge. And that's, you know, yeah. and the other thing that I just am going to say, because I have to, um, is like cash money. That's actually what works, right? Like, so I think, you know, I'm a person who has practiced in the social welfare field for a long time. We like our programs. But if you look at the data around just increasing income, like just increase income, right? Some of the UBI studies are incredible. The universal basic income studies are incredible, right? Like people are safer. They spend more time with kids, right? Time is valuable. If you don't have to be running around making ends meet, right? Your capacity to engage, to support, to hang out, to like parent the way that, you know, some of us with economic and racial privilege get to do every day. I don't want to I think it's very important. Like there are lots and lots of healthy families in poor communities, but it isn't easy from what I've witnessed standing next to folks for the last couple decades, right? It's not easy. So, Mm. but money, right? Like we love programs and rules and this and that, and like this qualification to do that. And if you don't re, re, right? Like I have a real, I mean, we could get into this, but like if we're gonna do social welfare, it should be easy. It should be folks making their own decisions, but cash helps, mm. you know. So. Thank you. Yeah. So let's open it up to the floor for questions or comments. Um, and Zach has something from someone watching on YouTube. Yes, Zach? Yeah, so Terry asks, um, why specifically do people who enter the program fail? Are there stats on reasons for failure? And she also notes, Calling them failures seems like a pro- a problem in itself, since it's the system that has failed them. I, I think she's talking about drug court. I think so too. Yeah. Okay. So when I you, thank you for the correction, right? Like I'm talking about the judge making a determination that that this person, for whatever reason, did not comply with with whatever the rules are. So um, I mean, what's really bananas looking at the Memphis records at the Shelby County records is women were required. So these are poor women struggling with substance use disorder. If you believe the court, you know, um, um, they had like, they had court appearances all the time, right? I'm talking about like 50 to 60 court appearances once or twice a week having to show up. If they don't show up, a warrant issues for their arrest, they're arrested and brought before the drug court. That happens two or three times, that's failure, right? So, so thank you for the correction. I don't conceptualize this as failure, but the, but, you know, I, I mean, in drug court is just so discretionary. It's based on this relationship with you and the judge and the counselors. So who, su- who succeeds and who fails mm. is very discretionary. And the, I just can't even imagine Right, having to make that many court appearances when you're struggling with everything else. It's so it's it's really absurd. It's mm. really absurd. Thank you, Terry, for the question. Yeah. So, folks here in the room, any questions or comments, reactions, responses? Yes. Can we get a a mic over there? Oh, thank you. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, well, first off, I want to thank you for writing the book because it sounds like you're a very busy person. And I can imagine <laughs> you thinking, is it really worth my time to write a book? It took six and a half years. So. <laughs> but, and also, you know, we're in Kelly's writer's house and this place is crawling with very ambitious writers. Mm-hmm. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the book came about as a book. You know, who contacted whom, what the editorial process was like. You know, did you try to get an agent? You know, all of those nuts and bolts kinds of things. Yeah. No, this is an embarrassing story, but I will tell it since you asked. Um, So I wrote another paper called Poor Support, Rich Support, um, which is about, which compares um, benefits for the wealthy and how they're structured to benefits for the poor and who gets what and blah, blah, blah. Um, Which, if you really want to read a law review article, go for it. Um, But um, the editor, uh, an editor at Cambridge contacted me, asked me if I wanted to turn that into a book, and I said, goodness, no, but can I pitch this other thing? So so, um, so I, he, uh, he sort of helped me through the process, and that's how I got the contract. Um, I'll say, 
Um, they've been amazing, but it's it's a you know the big huge university presses are I think different I, in my I don't know experience of one, so I shouldn't talk. My experience in this is that I relied a lot on my colleagues for edit for editing. Um, right. But um, I think it's different with smaller presses or different kinds of well, presses. The I outside reader will outside readers will give you something, and then yeah. your friends will do the rest. And the yeah. copy editor is just making sure the commas are right. Right, which they did. I miss them, despite being taught by Alpha Works. Oh, so. Thanks, Bob. Did you hire someone who was an actual editor? What? Did you hire someone who was an actual editor? I did not. I had, um, I had, I mean, if I wrote a law review article that was a chunk of the book, so I had feedback on that. I, what did I do? I mean, I, I, I talked about this. I mean, I had colleagues inside my university reading, um, and then I did two summers ago. I gave the book to four colleagues, and we spent about four or five hours together talking about it. So I had colleagues who were editing along the way. Um, but but no, I mean, it, it, the and I only got outside reader f feedback on the book proposal. Oh, weird. Yeah, I don't know why, yeah. And uh, law professors write articles, not books, We generally. do, we do. So this is unusual. Well, I mean, some law professors write books, but yeah, um, yeah no, so I, the story of how I ended up writing this particular book is kind of a strange one because I hosted a conference in the fall of 2015 um, where um, it was an organization called Class Crits and we invited activists from Tennessee to come to that conference and engaged in a session where we could think about how we could collaborate around certain justice issues sort of central to that particular conversation and that like at a break some organizers walked up and the law was still in effect and they were trying to extend it and they walked up and they were like can you help us figure out what's happening with these prosecutions so that's sort of I mean that's the origin story of why I became obsessed with this and the more I learned the more it was an example of what I wanted to to study so that's the story. thank you can we get the mic Hi. First Hi. of all, I'll just um, put in a plug for that Law Review article, which I actually think is excellent. Thank so, you. I don't want to deter people from reading the excellent Law Review article. Um, it's 65 pages and like 300 footnotes. <laughs> I love that. I really love that article. Thank and you. I'm, ex I'm so excited about the book. I wondered if you could, um, you know, just extrapolate a little bit, although, you know, the... the uh, legal issue you study is sort of limited in, in time, but I think there's so many implications of the of the book, and I'm thinking in particular about what's happening now with reproductive justice mm -hmm. and the fate of Roe versus Wade, so I, want, I wondered if you would indulge us and, and spin out some thoughts about um, that, and I also wondered if you wanted to say anything about um, you know, this literature that's emerging more in law journals about collateral consequences and yeah. just the effect of, you know, even if you get snagged for something very low level in the criminal justice system, the kind of ripple effects that that can have sure. for you and people in your um, in your circle. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the the reason I decided to write about a law that, you know, expired many, many years ago is that it is such a good example of the ways in which we criminalize care. Um, and, you know, I think it's, you know, reproductive just, right, we see what's happening with abortion and it's terrifying. Um, but all along, right, that we have seen these issues continue to happen. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, I wrote testimony for, I'm gonna say Montana, but I'm not sure where a, stat a similar statute was being debated. I think we will s continue to see these kinds of moves. And I think, you know, the, the gloss of this as a helping phenomenon, right, um, is, is absurd, right? It's absurd, like as a matter of empirics at this point, right? That's not what happened. And I'm glad I, you know, can say that with some authority now. But um, I think, you know, and I think as the racial dynamics and when we talk about drugs and reproductive justice and we're talking about white women, so we have to go a little softer in the rhetoric to get through, but um, in turn, right, but the same, right, all of this is happening and, you know, reproductive justice rights fall on poor women, you know, long before they fall on those of us with privilege. Um, in terms of collateral consequences, um, I mean, like just to fill in folks on what um, we're talking about, right? Collateral consequences are 
<clears throat> right? You get a conviction and then you can't get a license to do this. You lose your right to vote. You can't get public housing, right? And then a number of of collateral consequences that fall predominantly on poor people, right? Because many collateral consequences are written into um, social support for folks in poor communities. And just so you sort of have a sense, right? Our social support system, depending on when do you want to think about it, is split into two or three. One is sort of poverty-based support, so food stamps and welfare and public housing and Medicaid. And then there's sort of the Social Security-related benefits for folks who are not in poverty, Social Security, Medicare. Um, and then there's tax stuff, which is what that paper talked about, um, which is for wealthy people. Um, but a lot of those public institutions, right, you get a criminal conviction of any kind and you lose all of that. So you see a lot of, right, and this is, you know, the one of the pieces you, I talk about in the book is driver's licenses, right? So you lose, and, you know, in Philly you can get around maybe without a car. In rural Tennessee, forget it. Right. If you don't have access to your driver's license. So people lose their driver's license when they don't pay their court costs. And then they pick up. Right. Then they drive because they have to get somewhere. Right. And then they pick up a driving on suspended, which is more incarceration, more fines. Right. And we just spiral. So once you're in and we didn't get to talk about this, but the money piece of this is horrific. Right. Mm -hmm. I talk about a woman who is who who faced a court bill about thirty eight hundred dollars. Thirty six hundred was for jailing. Right, which we call pay to stay. Um, so you don't pay all of that, right? And you're just in forever, right? They're not going to let you out till you pay. So, does that answer your question? Okay. We are. I promise it's going to be more positive yeah, at the I'm end. I'm like the happy sunshine girl <laughs> up here. It's really depressing. <laughs> let's hear another question or a comment. How are you all doing? We have one up front. Oh no, let's go to the back and then the front. Okay, thank you. So I'm curious, you've spoken about how there have been different judges and legislators who push back against this. Are there any examples, either in your research or in the book, of uh, women or others who went through systems like that and then afterwards kind of spoke out and tried to make things better or change the system to be more just? Yeah, actually, so a lot, of, um, I, I rely really heavily on a study um, by an organization called Sister Reach, which is a Memphis-based organization, a reproductive justice organization run um, by women of color in Memphis. And they did, uh, sort of parallel to when I was doing my research, a, a doctor named Dr. Arisha Bowers, who was working with Sister Reach and the National Advocates for Pregnant Women, doing a study of women affected by the fetal assault law. So, so um, Sister Reach, Sister Song, right? Um, uh, the Healthy and Free Tennessee, lots and lots of reproductive justice organizations stepping out and talking really beautifully about this stuff. And um, they're folks that, that I quote in the book. I mean, I focus primarily on the case files, the hospital files, and interviews of professionals, because I really wanted to get into the heads of folks who were for whom this made sense and how it operated. Um, so I concentrated light on that, but I cite Dr. Brower's study over, all over the book. Um, mm -hmm about what she found when she talked to to some of the women and she she has one of my the one of my favorite quotes in the book which I'm gonna now try to find um one of the women she where is it oh here it is so she interviewed one woman affected by this fetal assault law and she's the woman said the laws in effect prevented it from being a care issue it became a law a liability issue right so so they are like pe people I really admire and am, am pleased to be in, in you know, collaboration with or working on that. Thank you for that question. Uh, Emma here, and then we'll go back to you. Yep. Yeah, somewhat relatedly, I was just curious about like what brought about the end of this law and like if it was organizing efforts or other things or just kind of a matter of expiration. That's kind of a good story. Um, so there was a lot of organizing around on the ground, medical, right? There was data pulled in an interesting fashion, um, thank goodness, um, around the um, diminishing rates of prenatal care in a hospital in actually in um, one of the urban jurisdictions in Tennessee, because women were 
scared, right? Rightly so. So you saw women less engaged. So that, I think, played a role. The doctors and the nurses and all of those folks mobilized. And, you know, one of the pieces that I, th um, one of the drug court judges actually, he's a guy I've done some work with um, trying to stop this from being renewed. He was very strongly opposed to the law, and he's a powerful um, figure in Tennessee around this. Um, some docs at Vanderbilt worked on it. And um, ultimately, the vote out of committee, the swing vote was a guy from East Tennessee who basically said, right, <laughs> He said there are not enough treatment resources, which is true, right? Like there were never, I mean, even close to the number of beds you would need in high quality care settings to actually, right, make this lie true. Um, and he was convinced by some folks that without the treatment resources, it wasn't fair to do this, which was interesting because he would have been perfectly fine to do it had there been the treatment resources oh if you read his testimony. So it took a swing vote on it a committee. It took a swing vote on a committee in the Senate in Tennessee. So, and it's come back a couple times, and folks have been able to and beat it Montana, back. And Montana, is that going to pass? It did not, and I think it was Montana. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. Yes, but it did not pass. It did, mm -hmm. I think um, get out of committee, but did not. I would but, think um, this issue, sadly, would be perfect for certain segments of conservative politicians. Yes. So it's going to rear its ugly head again, I'm sure. Yeah, it, it does. <laughs> it comes up. Yeah. I mean, and it's not that... We don't prosecute for women for this all the time. We do this all the time still, all over right, the country. Right. So. We have a question back there. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, you touched on this earlier a little bit. So if even when this conduct isn't criminalized and women receive some kind of treatment or some kind of support, obviously they can still have their kids taken away yeah. if they're found to be neglecting or abusing their child. Yes. So how do you... This is a huge question, and I don't really. I mean, it's okay. How do you propose, I guess, like uh, making it so that when women seek support or get a certain kind of support, it doesn't become so intertwined with their parenting being scrutinized and then being reported to child welfare and all of these things? Like, do we get rid of mandated reporter laws? Yes. Do we give them <laughs> universal basic income? Do we do right. both? Like, Right. How do we not make it so that women aren't just getting funneled to a different kind of discipline and also being separated from their children? Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually not a hard question. It's just hard to do, right, in this political environment. But, um, I mean, yes, on mandatory report, although that one's off the problem. But, yes, there's no reason, right? Like, doctors can report people. Everyone can report people if they think there's a problem. There's no reason to have a mandatory report system. Um, and lots of other laws that even do more to encourage reporting in this. And, but, you know, we have to shrink carceral systems and, and build support systems, Right. That's what we have to do. And we need to well, and we need to separate them. Right. And I get into a good deal of detail on the, the like on the mechanisms of that in the book. There's a lot about exactly how that plays out and what laws and structures. So if you want to know the specific reforms, you can, I guess, read the book. Um, but I also think, and crucially, like we need to build social support. It needs to be voluntary. It needs to be respectful. And you know, I talk in the beginning of the book about why I chose the word care because it's a little obscure, right? I could have said treatment. I could have said support, right? But I chose the word care because it has a moral imperative that suggests that um, not just what we do, but how we do it, right? That we need cash, which I already talked about, we need safety as conceptualized by communities who seek to be safe. Um, so there is, a, I mean, an abolitionist piece to this message, which is that we need to significantly shrink our punishment systems. We need to significantly grow our support systems, and we need to do it in a way that's respectful. If you want to know what like list of legal reforms, I can do that too, but, but that's the take home message. And then there's the need for comprehensive trauma-informed care, which is often yeah. mental health care. Yeah, that too. And it's, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, it's, I mean that's, I think that's big. That is huge. I mean, I, that's why I say it's easy to say and hard to do, right? Yeah. Um, I think that that's right, but I think we have to go even back before that, which is, yes, are there lots of folks walking around who are d significantly traumatized by violence and poverty and deprivation right now? Yes. Right. Um, and that's there is a moral imperative to address that. And, you know, it's not like we don't know how to do it. 
right? Um, and I talk about a care practice I love in the in the end of the book that that has figured out how to do that tremendously well. Yes. Um, but if we support folks, there will be less trauma. Speaking of the end of the book, mm -hmm. I would like to invite you now to read the last couple paragraphs okay. because we don't want these folks to depressed. go get a box lunch <laughs> and wander with their heads down through the darkness back to their lives and think that there's nothing to be done. This is a stirring ending, if I may say. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So if this book reveals anything, it demonstrates that intersectional forms of bias are structurally embedded in the systems that have been built in American society and in the decisions those with power make. Rules and practices of the kind discussed here reinforce and systematize the implementation of biased ideas. Professionals, even, and perhaps especially when they are attempting to help, are acting within the constraints of those systems and those ideas. Moreover, the failure of those professionals to challenge the status quo reinforces the systems as they currently operate. Ultimately, we cannot eliminate either those structures or those harms without naming and then seeking to eliminate intersectionally rooted structural bias. It is my hope that this book contributes in some small way to that project by revealing the structural mechanisms of criminalized care and revealing the logics shared by professionals in the systems that produce and reinforce those structures. But naming subordination in all its individual and structural forms is not enough. We need to name privilege too. To this end, one final thought. Although I hope that the readers of this book are, as di are diverse in every way imaginable, I suspect that most of you hold significant privilege along at least one axis of identity. As such, you have perhaps never been subjected to criminalized forms of care, and you likely have access to precisely the form of support that families and communities need and that privilege in America provides. Good jobs, economic security, a safety net in times of crisis, healthcare, education, and physical safety, to name just a few. As I write this chapter, the rights not to have children and to choose the conditions under which we have children are under some of the most aggressive attacks in recent history. Yet it has also always been true that economic privilege protect, provides protection even there. Privilege means that mistakes are forgiven, that healthcare needs are met with healthcare, and that the first response to crisis is one rooted in care instead of punishment. It means that privacy rights are robustly protected and decisions are respected. All of that has certainly been true in my own life as well as in the lives of those closest to me. So perhaps the best way to end this book is to suggest that we consider what it would mean to build a society in which those privileges are no longer the privileges of the few, but the rights of all. Build that society and criminalized care would have no place. Wendy Bach, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. The book is Prosecuting Poverty, Criminalizing Care, and I believe you can go to Cambridge University Press and Amazon and other places and pre-order it. I hope you true. will. We, usually at the end of a Writer's House event about a book, we have books and you can sign and so forth. That'll happen later. But <laughs> meantime, we have lunch. Please hang out. Wendy's going to hang out. I know that she would really be delighted to meet you. And I know that you would be delighted to meet her because I know her and she's delightful. Thank you again for coming. Please enjoy the lunch and come back to the writer's house sometime. One more time, let's thank Wendy Bach for this. <laughs> <laughs>